land Who has numbered every grain of sand Kings and nations tremble at his voice All creation rises to rejoice Behold a God seated on his throne Come let us adore him Behold a King nothing can compare Come let us adore of sinful men God eternal humble to the grave Jesus Savior risen now to reign Behold our God seated on His throne come let us adore Come let us adore Him 
Good morning, church, and welcome to this 14th week of doing webcasts here from Faith Bible Church for our worship service. Next week, we want to invite you to, to come to Faith Bible Church's building and uh, begin live worship in person once again on Father's Day, June 21st at 11 o'clock. It's going to be an outdoor service. We want you to come early so that uh, there's not a mad rush to find seats and parking and everything right before 11. Come bring lawn chairs, bring blankets. There'll be plenty of seating that you can social distance and find a good spot in front of the platform in order to, in order to be a part of that service next Sunday, June 21st, 11 o'clock. And since it's Father's Day, of course, we'll have a special gift for the dads. And since we didn't get to have a live service on Mother's Day, the Women of Faith, uh, Women's Ministry here at Faith Bible Church will have a gift for the ladies as well. So it's going to be a special day. It's going to be a great day to gather and uh, to rejoice that we can meet together once again. And um, we have information about the particulars of how we're going to gather and things in the layout and all of that on our website and also a link on our Facebook page. So check those things out. If you are a part of the Faith Bible Church family, is that you've come in the past, we probably have your email address on the file, and so we're going to be emailing that information out as well. If you haven't already received it, please get in touch with us if you'd like to receive it in email form as well. June 21st, and then, uh, and then on the 24th, the Women of Faith Ministry is going to celebrate the end of sheltering in place and the beginning of a return to normal by having a women's connection event on, uh, on Zoom, and that's on Wednesday, June 24th from 7 till 8.15, and uh, you can check out uh, our Facebook page and our website for more information about that as well. And then starting on Friday, June 26th at 7.30 p.m., the youth group ministry, the youth ministry here at Faith Bible Church under the leadership of Pastor Jay Lemp is going to start having an outdoor youth gathering, 7.30 p.m. on June 26th. Let me just mention a couple of resources as well. We've got resources that we hope could be of help to you during these days. Uh, this, we, if, sometimes it's hard to find the words and just the thoughts and so on to, to be able to put our, our heart into words uh, in praying. And so uh, we have some helpful uh, books in regards to that. Five Things to Pray for a, in a Global Crisis. That's this one right here. And we have these available for you for free. Just send us a message. You can, uh, you can send us a private message on, on uh, Facebook while during this webcast. You can uh, just make a comment in the comment section that you'd like a copy of this, and we'll get that to you. And then, you know, sometimes... It's, uh, it's good to do a heart check. And this one's called, this is brand new. It's called Five Things to Pray for Your Heart. I've, I've met a lot of folks, talked to a lot of folks that during these months of being uh, quarantined and all of that, 
that uh, sometimes our hearts have been prone to impatience, to, to anger, to fear. Uh, this is a, a, a book of prayers based on Scripture to help you uh, and me and to get our hearts right before God, to see God change our hearts and fill them with His love and His joy and His peace and His hope. And then, of course, in light of recent events, I want to just bring this resource to your attention again. It's called God's Very Good Idea. It's uh, aimed at three through six-year-olds by Trillia Newbell, and it's a great book on uh, God's great plan to have his family made up of people from, from all nations, all tribes, all languages, all colors. And uh, so God's big project, as it says, a true story about God's delightfully different family. So if you'd like a free copy of this, you've got kids or grandkids in that age range, we'd like to put a copy of this in your hands as well. Again, private message us or make a comment in the, in the chat section and uh, we'll get in touch with you and try to get that to you very soon. Thanks again for watching today. God bless you as we continue to worship and as we look forward to gathering together again in person next Sunday, be praying for great weather, but more importantly, be praying for God's Spirit to come among us and, to, uh, and to, that we would be able to make much of Christ and give Him great praise and honor for bringing us through this pandemic safely thus far and then bringing us back together to worship together next week. God bless you.
come once again to the study of God's word let's look to the Lord in prayer together we praise you holy God for your steadfast love that you have given to us in our Lord Jesus Christ and we just ask this morning Lord that you would hold us by your grace even as we have sinned against your grace and against your mercy this week we've we've marred our relationship with you and with one another with our with our neighbor And we repent of our sins. We we long, Lord, for you to restore us. So in your great love, we pray this morning that you would come and cleanse and heal and help us that we might live out our days for your glory and for your honor. Lord, we pray for racial justice and peace for our cities and nation, that you would give great wisdom to our leaders from the president on down through the Congress and the state governors and mayors and city councils and police departments and and we just pray that you would enable the church to be an instrument of healing racial divides we pray that you would grant wisdom and help to our health experts that treatments and uh, and vaccines would be discovered we pray for healing for the sick comfort for those who have lost loved ones during this pandemic we pray for those who are depressed or discouraged after so many weeks sequestered in quarantine. We thank you and we praise you for the, for the prospect of being able to gather together once again next Lord's Day for worship and, and for fellowship. We pray for relief for those that are struggling financially from the economic fallout from long shutdowns. Lord, make us 
as your people, make us instruments of your grace and restoration in these situations. Give us grace to pour ourselves out on behalf of the vulnerable of the world. Now we thank you for your word. We ask that you would enable us by your Holy Spirit to not only hear it and understand it, but also to respond to it with obedience that is motivated by love for you and for others. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read Ruth chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. Ruth chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. If you've got a Bible, you can follow along with me. And uh, again, Ruth 2, 8 through 13, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now, listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land, and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. We are in the fifth week in our sermon series, Redeeming Love in the Book of Ruth, and this is the question that we're asking week by week in our world, which is, as you can readily tell, a world of suffering, a, a world of chaos, a world of divisions, a world of violence. Is there, is there, I mean, is there really anyone who would debate that point, living in that world today? What does it mean for us, as the people of God, to be people who love like God? What does it mean for us to not be marked by the polarization common in the society around us? What does it mean for us, for Faith Bible Church in particular, to be marked instead by hesed love, by the, that Hebrew word hesed that we've talked about every week? It, it means steadfast love, covenant love. It's the theme of, of this book of Ruth. What does it mean for us to be marked by love? And what are the marks of that love? We've seen that, that chesed love is suffering. It's willing to suffer. It's committed. It's willing to make and keep promises. And it's willing to serve at great cost to itself. Today we're looking at this second chapter some more where we'll see that love protects the vulnerable ones in society. You know, at its best in history, the church was a sanctuary. We call this room in which we meet a sanctuary sometimes, but the church at times in history has actually been a literal sanctuary. From the 4th through the 17th centuries in England, by law, fugitives could take refuge from arrest in the church. Often there were boundary markers, a couple examples of them here on the screen, so that you would know when you had reached the boundaries of the sanctuary, when you had reached the area in which you could claim sanctuary that was owned by and under the control of the church. Churches were protected by what was called sanctuary laws. In fact, if you go to England today and some of the oldest churches, you can see posts in the front of the church that were called sanctuary posts. If someone was running and fleeing, a criminal, a refugee, someone who was running from a threat of some kind, once they crossed that line, that boundary, they were safe. They were, they were at home base, kind of like playing tag, you know. You got to base, you got to home, you got to free place, whatever it was. So you were safe from it and becoming it. So at its best, the church has literally been a sanctuary for the vulnerable, unprotected ones in the world. And that's what our theme is this morning. Chesed love is protecting love. The call of the church is to be a people and a place who protect the vulnerable, who offer safety for those who are under threat in our very dangerous world. Because protecting is necessary. This world is a violent and threatening place for many. There are people in our world who under, are under great threat of harm, probably billions of people. 
And it's not supposed to be that way. God made the world good, right? He made it a place of what the Bible calls peace, or shalom, a place of flourishing. That's how the world was designed to be, a place of flourishing and holiness, and wholeness and holiness, a place of, of justice and love, a place where no man and no woman and no child should ever feel worry or harm or danger or any threat of any kind. But unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. That's not the world the way that we have it now, we have a world that because of my sin and because of your sin, it has been shattered. And because of that sin, there are many people in our world and certain, you know, who have less power, less advantages, are under great threat and strain because of the shattering of shalom. The Old Testament often talks about what scholars call, sometimes call the quartet of the vulnerable, the quartet of the vulnerable. You can read about it, for example, in Exodus chapter 22. It indicates the kinds of people who are often the most vulnerable and unprotected ones in the world. The, lo the list includes first aliens, immigrants, because they lacked property and citizenship and direct involvement in the judicial process. It includes widows who in ancient society lacked any kind of direct legal representation and, and were not protected by a man. Third, orphans who lacked parents and the support of a family structure could easily be forced into forced labor and slavery. And then finally, the poor who lack social power, often they didn't have the connections that they needed to represent themselves in court or in society. Now here's what's interesting here in Ruth chapter 2. In the way that the narrator tells the story, Ruth actually represents all four of those categories. All four of these categories of vulnerable persons in one person. She's an alien. She's an immigrant. Five times in the text it says she's a Moabite from Moab. You know, kind of giving you, you know, a, a little bit of overkill there. Hey, look at this Moabite from Moab. Yeah, we get the point. You know, he's, he's emphasizing very clearly that this is a refugee who's vulnerable to prejudice and even racial discrimination. She's a widow. She was an orphan. Did you hear what Boaz said in the text that I just read? He said, you left your father and your mother. So in essence, she's an orphan in this society. She's detached from her clan. She's detached from her family tribe with no clan to surround her. And she was poor. She's out here gleaning in his field. She's a gleaner. That's what the poor did. They gleaned in the field, got the scraps that others left behind. Doesn't you know, she doesn't have a shekel to her name. Paul Miller says if you drew a ladder of social hierarchy of all the members of that ancient society, Ruth was at the very bottom. She is, she is below male servants. She is below female servants. She's at the very bottom without a male protector. She's vulnerable to attack and to molestation. By the way, I mentioned Paul Miller from time to time. This is a great companion study if you're looking for something to, to go along with the study of the book of Ruth. This is Paul Miller's study of Ruth. It's called A Loving Life. So you might want to check that out. Crossway Books, A Loving Life by Paul Miller. Um, you know, she's at the very bottom of society uh, without any protection, without money. She's financially destitute, without family. She's isolated. She's at risk. She's open to prejudice and exclusion. So here's Ruth, a woman of very low social standing and very high vulnerability, a person at great risk. This is, this is the scene as she enters into the community life of Israel in Bethlehem. And the question is, what are God's people going to do? What will God's people do with this person, with this vulnerable person? What are God's people going to do when the whole quartet of vulnerability shows up in one person, embodied in one person? That's the question of this text that hangs over this section. But it's not just a question of this text or the book of Ruth. This is a question that's asked throughout the Bible from the Torah or the Pentateuch to the Psalms, to the prophets, to the Gospels, to the epistles, to the book of Revelation. I mean, the whole Bible is asking that question. What are God's people going to do when the most vulnerable among them shows up in their midst? Let me ask it a different way. How are we going to know if we are successful as a church? I get emails, I get mailings in the snail mail 
almost every day, sometimes multiple ones in a day, inviting me to come to a conference, a seminar, a webinar, a webcast. I mean, I can't, if anything, my inbox has been full and overflowing more than ever during this pandemic with offers to come to this webcast, come to attend this webinar, read this, you know, this uh, blog post and so on. The promise is to show me how to have a successful church in general or particularly a successful church through the pandemic and coming out of it. And their definition of success usually boils down to one of three B's, buildings, budgets, and butts. You know, how, how awesome your, your building is, how big your budget is, and how many people are sitting in your seats. That's how the American church defines success much of the time. You know how God defines success for his church? I want to suggest to you this morning that, that he, maybe he uses a different metric. Maybe he's more concerned about how well the vulnerable are protected than buildings, budgets, and seats in seats. How does God define success? For example, Isaiah 58, verse 6 and following says this, is, this, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? when you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? I, th I think that's the question that God is asking in this hour. What are my people going to do when the most vulnerable show up among them? And the answer, according to these verses in Ruth, is God's people protect the vulnerable. God's people protect the vulnerable because it's necessary and because it's our calling. Protecting is our calling. That's the overwhelming answer. Not just because it's the nice thing to do, but because it's what, what God does over and over and over again. And we are called to be the people of God. God identifies himself in Scripture as the one who protects the vulnerable of the earth. When we have a guest speaker here at Faith Bible Church, I often introduce them and give you a few characteristics, few key characteristics. You know, this person has lived here, they're from here, they went to school here, they're married, they have this many kids, and so on. Uh, you know, that's, that's what you do in an introduction. And it's interesting that when God is introduced in Scripture, how often he is introduced as he is, for example, in Psalm 68, verse 5, as a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. This is who God is. This is who God says that he is. This is how God introduces himself. This is how Jesus introduced himself. In his first public sermon, he gets up in the synagogue. He deliberately, he could have chosen um, you know, all kinds of different passages to read and to comment on. He deliberately opens up the scroll to Isaiah 61, and he reads this according to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And he shuts the scroll, rolls it back up, stands up, and he says, this is about me, and drops the mic. He says, this is who I am. When, when God shows up after thousands of years of longing, of waiting for God to come, for the Messiah to come, when he finally shows up on planet Earth in human flesh, this is how he introduces himself. Sri Lankan theologian, theologian Vinoth Ramachandra points out, this, was, this would have been scandalous. This is scandalous. I mean, in nearly all ancient cultures of the world, the power of the gods was thought to be channeled through the rich and the powerful elites of society. If you opposed the rich, if you opposed the powerful, it was thought that you were opposing God or the gods. But in Israel, you notice it's exactly the opposite, time and time and time again, exactly the opposite. God identifies with the weak and the poor and the widow and the powerless and the orphan. And he says time and time again, if you come against them, you're coming against me. To come against them 
is to come against God. Consider, again, Exodus chapter 22, verses 21 through 23. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. I mean, God's not playing here. I mean, I guess, you know, he is serious about this stuff. I, I dare you to put, you know, take those verses, put them on a plaque and put them above your fireplace, right? And put them on your mantle. Well, that's not probably a passage that we would choose to write out in beautiful calligraphy, you know, and put in a frame and, or cross stitch it or something like that. But God says, if you come against the foreigner, the, the stranger, the alien, the immigrant, if you come against the widow or the orphan or the poor, he goes on to say in the very next verse, I will hear their cry and I'll come after you. So this is the very heart of the character of God to be a God of justice, to stand on behalf of the oppressed and to protect the vulnerable of the earth. And we see God doing that in this story, in the book of Ruth. We see him in his sovereignty and in his providence leading Ruth into the fields of Boaz. You know, the, the narrator says it just so happened that she ended up in a field that was owned by Boaz. Oh, really? No, God is orchestrating and overseeing seemingly random events, giving Ruth favor with the field manager, tenderly protecting her from harm. Like Boaz says in verse 12, God is the one who is covering Ruth with his sheltering wings. That's a great image, isn't it? God is like this sheltering bird, or protecting his vulnerable little birds from harm and from threat. God protects, so this is who he is. But he uses the hands, he uses the mercy and the justice of his people to do it in many cases. Boaz is his agent here. Boaz is the instrument in God's protecting kindness. Boaz shows up in his fields, he sees this immigrant gleaner, and unlike Ruth, he's a person of power. I mean, Ruth is at the bottom of the rung, low power, you know, low social standing, high vulnerability. Boaz is the exact opposite. He's a person of power. He's at the top of the ladder, low vulnerability, a powerful landowner. He's got all the wealth. He's got all the resources. He holds all the cards. He's everything that Ruth is not. He has everything that Ruth doesn't. And he shows up in this field. He sees this foreign immigrant gleaner. What's he going to do? What is this strong man going to do? I mean, it could go either way at this point. Is he going to treat her with kindness and generosity? Is he going to mistreat her and take advantage of her? What's he going to do? And we know what he does. He protects. Look at verses 8 and 9. He says there again, he says, stay here. You know, don't go anywhere else. If you go somewhere else, you could get hurt. I can't protect you in other places. Stay here. He surrounds her with his people. Then verse 8, on top of all that, he informs her that he's in, told his young men, given his young men a solemn charge that they are not to molest her. That's really the meaning of the Hebrew word that's used here that the ESV translated, I've told him, don't touch you. He, he, he knows the threat that she is under for sexual and physical violence. And he quickly makes it clear to these other men, you mess with her, you mess with me. He says to her, this is a safe place for you. Why does he do all that? Why does he say that? He responds this way, as we see in verse 12, because he loves God. Because he has the heart of God within him. He sees a person at the height of vulnerability, and he does everything that he can to respond with the heart of God. Remember, the, the book of Ruth takes place in the time of the judges. It's not a, you know, if you've read Judges, we studied it here at Faith Bible Church a few months ago. It's not a fun read. One of the only good things about reading Judges is that when you finish, right? And when you finally get through it, because it is not a pleasant read. Judges was a time when there was chaos, there was, there was terror, there was horrific violence going on in Israel, and often that violence was enacted against women. The book of Judges is full of men abusing their power, hurting vulnerable people, especially women. And that violence was often overlooked and accepted and even excused. And in contrast to this, the narrator of Ruth is holding up to us an example of a very different kind of man, a man of great power and authority who uses his strength not to abuse but to protect. 
And that releases Ruth immediately from immense stress. In verse 10, you know, she just kind of almost collapses with relief at his feet. And then he honors her as a person made in the image of God in verses 11 and 12. He publicly praises her as an example of chesed love to her mother-in-law. He honors her as someone who is something powerful to contribute and even emulate among his people. He recognizes her dignity publicly in front of all of his field hands. Now, let me say this to the men for just a moment, may I? I just want to speak to the, to the men who are watching this webcast right now. Guys, here is a model of masculinity that is marked by chesed, by love. It's, it's a masculinity that not only seeks to protect vulnerable people, but honors the dignity and the worth of women. We know that women still live every day with the knowledge that lurking around in the back of their minds, if not in, you know, in, in the frontal lobe of their mind, that, uh, you know, it, it, that, that they face the possibility of abuse and victimization. Those are always possibilities. We know that one-fifth to one-third of all American women have experienced some kind of traumatic experience, and even higher numbers have experienced harassment and objectification or worse. Still today, 3,000 years after Ruth was written, the greatest threat to women is men in power. And men, we do damage to women when we dismiss fears or when we trivialize this issue. When we buy or we look at porn, we are fueling the culture of exploitation that impacts even the women around us. We do harm to women when we ignore them, when in our places of work we silence their voices, or when we do not honor their place at the table and see them as equal image bearers. That's not chesed. Hesed always seeks to protect, to dignify, to honor, to bless. And here in the book of Ruth, we see a vision of what people, especially men in power, can do to create places of safety where the vulnerable can be protected, where people can be free of strain, free of fear, where women can be honored and recognized for the God-given dignity and, and can, for their God-given dignity and can powerfully contribute to God's story the way that Ruth does. So we've seen these things. We've seen that, that protection is necessary, protecting is necessary, because the world is really a dangerous place for many people. And we've also seen that God's people are called to be the agents of that protection, of God's protecting kindness. So what do we do in response to that? Like Boaz, we do two things. We see and we act. Boaz saw Ruth. Verse 10, you notice it there. He's a powerful man, but he had an eye for those in need. That's not easy to do in our world. I mean, today we have whole neighborhoods that have been built in order to avoid having contact with the poor. We call them suburbs. As we become more affluent, we become more isolated from the poor and from the vulnerable. God's people are those, however, who see and who act on behalf of the vulnerable, the poor, the elderly, the refugee, the immigrant, the widow, the orphan. Do you see these people? There are, there are many people like Ruth among us. God is asking us, do you see them? Do you hear them? And then we act. And then when, when we see, we act. We act in simple, ordinary ways, sometimes big, extraordinary ways. We act to protect our neighbors from harm. And we do this together as the people of God. We do this as a family, as, the, as the, called the church. You can do it with your family, with your own kids. You, could, you, know, you can ask you know, your children around the dinner table, who are the vulnerable among us? Kids, you, you can do this. You know, do you know that, that every day in your school, when you get back to school, or maybe in your neighborhood, you know, there are kids who are being harmed. Some of them maybe are being harmed by their parents or some other adult in their life. Many of them are being harmed by their classmates or by their, by their neighbors. You know, they're excluded, they're left out, they're made fun of. You know, go after those kids. That's a powerful act of love. To walk up to another kid and say, hey, you want to eat with me today for lunch? Or you, want to, you want to play with me on the playground? You want to go for a walk? If, you know, look at the need for, for foster care. Look at the need for adoption. If you, if you have a position of power or influence, God has given you that position, that place of power and privilege, not for your own good, but to act on behalf of the most vulnerable and unprotected. 
how can, how can we do that? How can we see the vulnerable and act to protect them? You know, it, this is not a political thing. This is not a red and blue thing. We do not align ourselves with agendas of political parties. We do not allow the world to tell us, the church, the people of God, who we should care about, who we should care for, and who we should ignore. We stand for the vulnerable, period, full stop. We stand with immigrants, we stand with refugees, we stand with the unborn, we stand with the disabled, we stand with women, we stand with people of color who experience racism and discrimination, we stand with orphans, we stand with the elderly, we stand with widows, we stand with the poor. That's who we are. That's what we do. Why? Because even though there are, there are many differences among us, in terms of physical vulnerability. Some of us have very low physical vulnerability. Some of us very high. But all of us are on the same plane spiritually. We are all terribly in need of protection. Sin has cut us off from our Father, from our Protector, and we are all in serious eternal danger. Without grace... You're a marked man. You're a marked woman. I'm a marked man. You're marked. You're in trouble. You're on the path of destruction. But here's what happened. Jesus Christ, the one who is at the, the very top of the ladder, the one with all the power, the one with all the glory, the one with all the privilege, the one with all the authority, he looked down and he saw us. He saw us. The triune God saw us in our vulnerable, unprotected state. And what did he do? He acted. Didn't he? Didn't God do it? He acted. He left aside all of his power. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of his servant. Philippians 2, like we saw last week, you've been born of the Virgin Mary, lived his life as a common laborer and died an excruciating death, taking our sin and our sorrow upon himself. He made himself nothing. He took on our pain. He took on our hurt. He took on our shame. He took on our sin. He took on our vulnerability to give us his power, to give us his glory, to give, make us safe in his family, in his kingdom forever. So this morning, I invite you, I implore you to receive Jesus Christ this morning as your protector if you've never done that in your life. If you never received Jesus, you can do it today. I mean, this moment, just cry out to him and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my life. Be my protector. Be my provider. Be my savior. Be my rescuer. Be my forgiver and leader of my life. For Jesus' sake, this moment you can do that. I want you to know that when you receive Jesus, here's what happens. Jesus says to you, you know, here with me, Jesus says, and here amongst my people, you're safe. You found sanctuary. You're protected. You're not going to die. You're going to stand one day on a new heaven and a new earth with me forever, where there will never be hurt or pain ever again. You can never, ever, ever be let go. This is our power, brothers and sisters. This is our motivation because Jesus has done this for us. We may do this for the world. This is the protecting power and work of love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for loving us with a never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your promises to us that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, will be rescued, will be given sanctuary now and forever in Christ and in his forever family. Thank you for these moments together in your word. Thank you for Ruth and Boaz and for, for sharing their story with us through your word pray that we might we might grow in our capacity 
to, to love and protect the vulnerable. Give us hearts as big as yours. Break our hearts, Lord, with the things that break yours. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out of me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out of me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out of me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. Overwhelmed and satisfied my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. Just one thing remains. Just one thing remains. Your love never fails. Whether online or in person, we're looking forward to being back with you next Sunday. Have a wonderful rest of your day.